Ch-ch changes. It's episode 22 of For Our Edification. Thanks for joining For Our Edification. I'm Eddie Francis. For Our Edification is available on your favorite podcast platforms. Also, we have a few episodes available on YouTube. If you want to check out past episodes, then go to eddiefrancis.com slash For Our Edification. Changes, changes. Whenever they come in an organization, it could be a leadership change. It could be a policy change. It can be rough on folks. But why is that? Why don't folks just roll with the punches, right? Well, our next guest understands why these changes can be so rough on people. She has spent nearly 20 years working with organizational leaders in leadership development and managing post-merger and acquisition integrations. And to her, folks being on their feelings, that is perfectly understandable. The views and opinions expressed on For Our Edification do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the hosts, guests, or any entities with which we are affiliated. Joining us on For Our Edification, is Dr. Robin M.L. Johnson. She's the founder and the chief change leadership advisor for Design Org Solutions. So let's start with the, the first, the basic thing. For the uninitiated people, when it comes to change management, what exactly is change management? So change management is managing all the changes that need to happen in a change initiative. It is getting employees and leadership to adapt to the new thing, whatever that new thing is, and it's getting them to adopt it. And so in a nutshell, that's what change management is, is getting employees to adapt and to adopt the new thing that's happening. And what does your company do, uh, Design Org Solutions? Yep, thanks for asking. So Design Org Solutions is an organization effectiveness firm. And what we do is we mainly focus on organizations who are going through a merger and acquisition integration. So after the two companies have completed the deal, now the two companies have to come together to become one new company. And um, so we help those two companies come together as one new company. So if you can imagine, there are HR pro um, practices and policies that need to become one. There are IT processes and practices and procedures that need to become one. But that's it. And so that happens all throughout the organization, your sales organization, your quality organization, your operations organization. They all have to become one. My firm manages that process of becoming one. Okay, that's okay. That's a lot of layers. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> we, we'll get again to that in a second because I, you know what is is really interesting. I've been through change management before. Um, I've had a change of, of 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 leadership, but I've also been part of the new leadership that's come into a, a, an organization. And um, even though I've seen all those parts work, just hearing you describe it, it's for whatever reason. It still sounds kind of new to me, and I don't. I'm not exactly yeah. sure why. Um, but but let's put a pin in it. Let's put a pin in it. The thing that I find really interesting when I, I take a look at your videos and um, I look at uh, some of the stuff you've written and some of the stuff that you've written on social media about change management is that you focus a lot on emotional intelligence. Why is that? Because everything that we do as people, human behavior, emotions drive everything we do. Yeah. So whether you disagree with what's happening in the change process, your your behavior, how you feel, your disagreement will drive what you do or what you don't do. Even if you agree with what's going on, how you feel drives what you do. So if I agree with what's happening, then I'm going to be on board, right? Yeah. If I disagree with what's happening, then I'm then resistance is going to occur and I'm not going to be on board and I'm not going to do the things that um, are being asked of me. I might even go as far as sabotaging the the initiative itself. <laughs> so I've seen that one. Yeah. <laughs> so I focus a great deal on emotions versus emotional intelligence. And here's why emotional intelligence is something that I'm hoping that everybody comes to the table with a level of emotional intelligence maturity. So if it's the leadership 
I need them, or I'm hoping that they have great interpersonal skills, mm -hmm. right? That they, uh, they can take notice of what's happening and that they will become sensitive to what's happening in the group, you know, amongst their teams within the organization, or that they be that they be compassionate about what's going on. Here's the thing about change, uh, especially when it comes to the merger and acquisition integration. But even if it's just a new uh, leader coming into the organization, you are now inheriting employees who did not ask to work for you. Uh, uh -huh. Right. So. Uh -huh. When I am being interviewed for an organization or for a position, I'm interviewing the organization as much as the organization is interviewing me, correct? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so I am interviewing this new manager. Is this somebody I can work with? Is this someone I think I'm going to like? And we make decisions on whether or not we're going to take the position based on if we feel like we can work with a hiring manager. Now, all of a sudden, I've been given this new manager either because of the integration or because just, you know, a new manager has come on board. I don't know if I'm going to like them or not, right? Mm -hmm. I didn't ask to be a part of their team, but here we are. And so from that standpoint, I'm just hoping that emotional intelligence is at a maturity level. If not, now we have to work, we have to work through that. So, 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 so is the onus for emotional intelligence intelligence is that more on the leader than it is the people who are in a position of okay nope so when it comes to the employees mm -hmm. and and the leadership i need them to be mature in their stress management and what that looks like is that they're flexible so as new information comes, that they can actually adapt their emotions, their thoughts, and their behaviors to the new information. So I need you to be flexible. That's a part of emotional intelligence. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need you to have optimism. So let's not go into this change already with a, oh God. You know, so if I am dealing with employees and leaders who are going into this change with, here we go again, you know, we tried this the last time and it didn't work. You know, why are we doing this now? You know, no optimism whatsoever. Once again, I've got to work through those issues before I can get them to adopt. Because remember, that's what change management is, helping them to adopt the new thing. So the more mature they are in their emotional intelligence, the better, the quicker they get to the adoption. And that's the whole point. Change management, hopefully, will decrease that time from the announcement of change back to being in a place where we are now implementing and we're growing and we're making money again. Okay, so this takes me back to how complicated it can be to have all these different divisions. So let's say you're looking at some kind of a Fortune 500 situation. Well, no, no, even better. So in, in my situation, for example, I'm at a university. I always tell people, you know, you have all these people who, when they look at universities, they say, well, you just run it more like a business. You'll be better. But I don't think it's that simple. I, I look at a university more like a small city because mm -hmm. you have all these citizens who you don't have control of. You don't have control of their agendas. That students a lot of times. Uh, but then you also have the, the faculty who have their own thing going on and, and they're kind of encouraged to do their own thing. And so you have a very small segment that's quote unquote controlled with the employees. Yeah. And so with all those different, all those different areas and all those different moving parts, it, it would seem to me that the smart play uh, for the people who are part of the change management, the people who are part of the, of the acquisition, who are leading that whole charge, it would seem that the smart play for me, for them, is to sit down and to have a very careful, strategic conversation about who's who, what's what. Yeah, they absolutely. Put, they, they put every scenario in front of them. Like one of the uncontrolled scenarios I've seen in a couple of uh, instances with change management is the rumor mill. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard they're going to shut this down. I heard they're going to shut this down. I heard they're going to change this person. I heard they're going to change yeah. that person. <laughs> um, and then, and then in one situation, 
one leader that I ran across, actually, he actually made it worse when he sat there and said, well, you know, I'm going to centralize all the IT operations. So there are a bunch of people I don't need. He actually said that in a meeting. And it just, everybody just went nuts after that. It was, it was there was no peace. And then yeah. there were rumors coming from the organization where he had previously worked. So all those people were in communication. So it was seen to me that one thing the leadership should probably be responsible for is sitting down and have a really strategic conversation to help people manage the, their mm-hmm, fear, mm-hmm. to help people manage their anxieties. Am I off base with that? You are totally not off base. So here's the thing. I have not uh, had the privilege yet of managing change for a university. But what I would say is most times if the, well, like, I guess it doesn't even matter if it's university, if it's corporation, it doesn't matter, nonprofit, most leaders do not know how to manage change, Uh-oh. which is by people like me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't expect to hear that. I didn't know we were doing that today. Okay, got gotcha. you. Go I have a business yeah. because yeah, most yeah. people do not know how to manage change. And so you get what you saw with the leader who sat in the meeting and said what he said. You get the Elon Muskers of the world who puts mm. out information that's going to drive uncertainty and chaos because they don't understand that their messaging is what's going to drive whether or not people adopt what they're trying to do, right? And, and, and he's and he's a narcissist. So he and is, he's a narcissist, and he is yeah. so because he is so focused on self interest. He wants to be seen, and he doesn't like feedback. Correct. Right. Okay. Correct. Yeah. So, so the first thing leaders need is someone who can coach them through how do you manage this change. Well, you don't go in front of your people and say. I'm getting rid of all of you. You know, we don't need you. We're the very first thing that I do in any engagement is called a change impact assessment because we need to understand how are your how is this change or all of these changes going to impact your organization. A part of that is doing a stakeholder engagement. Mm. So in a university mm. setting, you students are you know are part of the stakeholder. Um, you got your faculty, that's a part of a stakeholder. Then you've got your administration, you've got your staff, you know, whether it's the admin, it's the, you know, the maintenance folks, you got your IT, those are all different stakeholders. And the very first thing the leader should do is have a conversation with each set of stakeholders and understand and help them understand, okay, this is where we're trying to get to. We need your help in getting there. So the more feedback the leader can collect. So it's not the leader saying, hey, this is what we're doing and we're getting rid of you and we don't care Mm -hmm. if you like it or not. It is how can you help us get there? You know, what do you see that needs changing? How can how can we improve? Because they know what's best. They're doing the work every day. They're on the front. You know, they're on the front lines. They know what needs to be improved way more than the leader, him or, or, or herself. Yeah. So uh, we've got to do stakeholder engagements to help us understand how people are feeling, where's the resistance going to come from, you know? So, and, and a leader may actually sit their C-suite leaders or their top university leaders in a room and say, this is where we're trying to go. This is what I'd like to see. This is where I want to be in three years and have leaders nod their heads while le- while those leaders are saying, mm, this is not going to work. This is crazy. This is, we get that all the time. Wow. So you need to have your stakeholder engagement um, meetings to understand who really is feeling the change, who's not feeling the change, um, where the resistance may come from, because then I need to keep an eye on that person. Because as the leader goes, so goes their their team their people right mm-hmm. so if the leader doesn't like what's going on neither will their team mm-hmm. so the stakeholder engagement is hugely important 
And um, I think I answered that question completely. No, you did. <laughs> I, 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 no, you did. Because because the, the other thing, see, now my wheels are really turning. Because, I'm sure. <laughs> well, yeah, because I mean, I've seen this so many times. And one of the things, you know, uh, one of the things I learned about, uh, and you're, you're a doctor of strategic leadership. Leadership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So in my strategic leadership program, one of the things that just blew my mind was learning about expertise authority. So, you know, you have these people, even down to the maintenance staff, they have expertise authority. They know exactly what works. They know exactly yeah. why it doesn't work. Yeah. And if you're not even bothering to even have a conversation with them about how the change is going to affect their work and how their work is going to affect the change, then it seems like you're setting yourself up uh, for sabotage in some Absolutely. cases. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's that's exactly right. Um, so it's so important for you to understand. And again, the change impact assessment helps you to understand what are all the changes that need to be made. And, and outside of the stakeholder engagement and understanding how they're feeling and their emotions about it, the other issue is, so you want to make these changes, but oftentimes we forget that this change is going to impact this group. We know this change is going to impact this group. That's why we're changing, because we want this thing to be changed. But we forget that, you know, the maintenance folks are also going to be impacted by this change. And so we don't include them in any of the project meetings. We don't hear the voice of the customer is what we call it because they are a customer. We don't get mm. their voice. Mm. We don't understand from them how the change that you're going to make here is going to affect them back there. And so the, the privilege of having the change impact assessment is understanding who are all going to be affected by the change, all the groups, so that we don't miss anybody. Because here's what happens, Eddie. We get to the end of the, initi the initiative and we're about to implement and almost inevitably we will get to a point and somebody will say, well, y'all didn't talk to us. Right. Hey, no one, no one said anything to us about this and this is going to affect how we do ABC. And now we're scrambling. And so that again is the benefit of having a change expert on your teams as you're making these initiative changes because that happens when you don't have a change person on your team that you get to the end of that, that initiative and you have somebody say, wait, 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 you didn't include us. Yeah. Change it, it, but you also, but aren't you, you also count out the people who can pardon the expression, but they can show you all the bodies are buried and they can, they can hip you to some serious game if you <laughs> yeah. just if you just listen to them. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. They, but then they can also tell you how things, especially if they're people. And I think a lot about people who are in 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 um, hourly positions, you know, uh, light maintenance people, and, and that because they're often from a local community, mm -hmm. and they can they can tell you how this is going to affect the local community. Hey, you're brand new here. You don't know how these folks work. Exactly. You don't, you don't know how the community is going to sabotage everything you're trying to do because I can, but I can tell you, I can help you. That's right. Mm -hmm. You are listening to the For Our Edification podcast and you're watching it too, by the way. I'm Eddie Francis and we are talking to Dr. Robin M.L. Johnson. She is the uh, founder and chief change leadership advisor for Design Org Solutions. Okay, 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 okay. So, so at what point does the leader look at something or, or, or all parties at all parties does it get to a point when even in change management all parties look at something and they say you know what there's no need to change this we can we can just keep everything running the way it is because we have the right resources in place we have the solutions in place we have the people in place we're not going to fix what's broken at what point? At what point do we do that? Which might sound counterintuitive to change management, but or is that part of change management too? So I think that yes, there are times when we say when when the management team says we're not going to fix what's broken because fear they don't think that the, the change is going to work. 
Mm. or they don't think they really have the resources to make the change happen, or maybe it just costs too much. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want to spend the, the, the money that they need to send. They need to spend to make the changes. So yeah, that absolutely happens. And when I am beginning an engagement, one of the things I ask management is what's not changing. Mm -hmm. And we really don't, we don't do that enough. We know what's changing. We, that's why you brought us in. But what's not changing? Because your employees, your community, whatever that looks like, they need to know what's not going to change. And that's important because the moment an announcement is made that change is about to happen, uncertainty, chaos, frustration, anger, you know, all of that sets in. And people are nervous. You know, they want to know if they're going to have a job at the end of this. I mean, like, and that's without any information at all. All kinds of thoughts start to go through your head, right? And so that creates a level of, uh, that creates chaos with any organization. And the less management talks about it and communicates, the more the uncertainty rises. Mm. And so we need to be able to tell employees for the sake of them just, you know, kind of maintaining some routine for the sake of them holding on to something that they are used to, you know, something that, you know, remains a little constant in their life, we need to be able to say, this is not going to change. Uh -huh. And so we need the management to be really honest with themselves. Look, if you don't want to change this, that's fine. It can remain broken. Just let us know what it is so that we can communicate that to the employees so that we can kind of settle their thoughts, uh -huh. Uh -huh. you know, settle their heart. So that because a part of getting employees to adopt what's happening, getting them to adopt the new is helping them to maintain routines. Uh -huh. We know it's chaotic right now, but I need you to keep doing the things that you've always done. And you might hear a leader say, we're going to continue to fly this plane <laughs> in, the, in the midst of all of this chaos. And that's cool if that's what you want us to do, but give us something to hold on to while we're flying this plane. You know, I have to say that one of the expressions I have come to hate is we're building a plane while we're flying it. And I'm yeah. just sitting there like, <laughs> because, it, it, because honestly, when I hear people see that say that, I understand that what they're saying is, listen, there's a lot going on and we just have to keep going. But for some people, it comes across to me as a crutch. And it comes mm -hmm. across to me, to some extent for some people, as an excuse to do some thoughtless stuff. Mm -hmm. um, because it's mm -hmm. just like, hey, you know, you just have to roll with how the things go. Just roll the punches, y'all, and everything's going to be just fine. Yeah, and, and yet I'm still at this point where I've learned over the course of time after seeing several organizations go through change management, some harsh, mm -hmm. um, some, not, some not so harsh, but I always come back to if you would just stop for a second and just really think about who you're dealing with, because here's my next question. How much does cultural competence come to play in this as as in you know, to be blunt, you see change management with a bunch of black folks involved or a bunch of brown folks involved, or you see change management in, when it comes to a lot of women being involved or a lot of men versus a lot of women. How often, how, do, is that something that you have ever had to say, listen, you know, there is a cultural component that we have to talk about here. So there's a culture component in every change, right? especially, you know, Again, as I'm looking at mergers and acquisition integrations, every company is bringing their own culture. So I'm not necessarily looking at black, white, brown. I'm looking at how leaders respond to difficult situations in this organization versus how they respond to them in that organization. How are people rewarded? What gets you rewarded? Mm -hmm. You know, what, um, what behaviors are okay? what behaviors are not okay. So one company may come with a culture that they are authoritarian and mm -hmm. it's perfectly okay 
for their managers and for their supervisors to uh, be condescending and uh, just be nasty towards their employees and expect employees to just, you know, still want to work, you know, happily for them. <laughs> and then they may be merging with a company who's exactly the opposite, you know? So they're looking for management staff who can show some empathy, who has some compassion, who understands social responsibility, you know, who, who are interpersonal. Or, and or, so, or where the employees are used to having a voice. And where employees are used to having a voice. You know, maybe the organization is, and this would be incredible, that the organization is, you know, uh, bottom to top, where employees have that voice and employees kind of um, have a say in how things move. And, you know, maybe the company is, we don't make a decision, we don't make a move until everybody is on the same page versus uh, and, and what that does is it slows down all decisions because everybody needs to be okay with the decision versus an organization where we make decisions quickly because we need to move quickly and so when i'm looking at culture those are the things that i'm looking at not necessarily um from a dei standpoint if you will okay and and, and is that because is that because you want to focus, um, you really want to focus on things such as skill set, you want to focus on things such as experience, you want to focus on things such as adaptability and that that sort of thing. You want to really focus more on, on working skill sets as opposed to um, anything that may have to do with gender or ethnicity or anything like that. Yeah, my focus is how do I bring these two organizations together to yeah. operate well together? So that's my focus. Yeah, and I let the others handle the the you know the more DEI kinds of yeah issues. yeah, and that, and that might be a hard hard pill for some folks to swallow because you know um, you know black folks we we're sitting here going okay you know we 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 work a lot differently than a lot of people. Sometimes we say that and that's not necessarily true. We just see ourselves working differently. But, you know, when it comes to things such as HR, I, I, I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, I'm very thankful my, for my experience in recruiting because it really, really did force me to look at HR for, uh, from, um, from a standpoint that really focuses much more on things such as talent and skill set and experience before bringing in some other stuff that has nothing to do with, you know, how well someone can actually do the job, um, yeah. you know, that sort of thing. So that's, that, that to me is, um, that to me, I, I think it can become very interesting, but uh, on the, on the other hand, I think it's only as interesting as some people make it sometimes. Um, yeah. And, and of course, so go back to the university ex uh, example, you've got the community who are also stakeholders. And so your community who may be all black, you know, or predominantly black, who are saying, we really want the organization, we really want the university to do this. In that case, then absolutely, we wanna take, we wanna take the community's voice into consideration. How do we implement this? How do we include that? Uh, but I think that at a corporate level, it's just not it's just not even possible for me to focus on something that um, you know that's small. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. Well, even in the case of so you know, I'm I'm working at my third HBCU, mm -hmm. um, and so even when it comes to an HBCU versus a predominantly white institution. You know, you you are dealing with different factors when it comes to ethnicity, when it comes to cultural competence and that sort of thing. But yeah. at the end of the day, you still have to figure out, you know, what's going to work best for the bottom line of the institution, which I know, just, I know hardcore academics hate terms such as bottom line. But that's that's how you get a job, dude. Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> you know, but uh, but at, at the end of the day, you do have to figure out what are those things where you have to kind of pull things such as ethnicity and gender out of it and say hey listen this is really what we're trying to do this is our north star mm -hmm, there, mm -hmm. there are some things on the table that don't involve those factors but i think i think your your, right. your view is pretty fair in saying hey listen when we do have something that involves those factors 
we do have someone or a department dedicated to, to taking that into consideration and figuring out how to make it all work together. Absolutely. Here's, here's another thing. When you're doing, an, and I keep going back to the impact assessment because it's so critical in the process, but one of the things um, I'm doing is I'm helping the leadership prioritize all the changes that need to be made. We've got tons of changes that need to happen, but everything can happen today. Hmm. So some things we can start immediately, but some things may need to wait 90 days, you know, or six months from now. So we're not saying it's not important. So the community is important and, and what they want to see happen through this change is vital, but it can't happen today because we need to work on these things first, right? So a university, and I know that people are probably not going to like this, but at the end of the day, <laughs> a university is still a business, <laughs> right? I'm a market. I'm a marketing person, so I'm completely okay with that. I am. Still, a, I mean, I'm a PR and marketing person, so to me, it's a business. Okay, it's a business. I mean, no, no money, no employment, and the the way you bring in dollars may be different, mm -hmm. but you still have a. A, a, a CEO or, you know, the head of the organization and they've got their leadership team and they've got their teams and, and, you know, you've got profit and loss and, you know, you got a board. And so it's still a business. And so with that said, if I'm coming in to manage change, I'm going to manage it in that way. Okay. And the community is just one more stakeholder. Yeah. Yeah. And we will engage with that stakeholder to make sure that they stay in the process, but understanding that their, their part of the process may not happen today. It may happen 120 days from now. And, you know, it, it, and it does, it does bring to light that, and I think this is something that's very important for people to understand. You, you, I, you know, you mentioned what the organization's priorities are. Well, every organization has a different set of priorities. And for some organizations, they do make DEI a priority. They make it Absolutely. part of their strategic plan. They do mm -hmm. make it a North Star. <laughs> for other organizations, they're sitting there going, okay, well, yeah, we're going to address DEI. We should address DEI. But let's be, let's be brutally honest. At the end of the day, we have a facilities problem. We got to fix the doggone facility because... This building is about to come down on us. Yeah, yeah <laughs> so, right, right. Hmm? So we'll do hmm. we'll deal with DEI a little later. Right now, we need a place for the DEI people to work. <laughs> That's so, right. <laughs> so, yes. what what is? I hate to ask this question, but I really, but I think it's important uh, for people to hear. You know, these types of examples. Is, is there? Is there is there a story when it comes to change management where you might have worked with a client and? The situation was kind of heartbreaking and you just you just got to a point where I'm not so sure what we can do here because, you know, or maybe you maybe maybe you turned a client down. You didn't accept the job because you're going, I don't even know where this is headed because we, we just have a bit of an issue here. We have a cluster. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. is, is there any kind of situation to, that you can recall that was heartbreaking or one that you know of where. You just didn't know how the change was even going to be possible. Yeah. So one of my last clients, which was uh, happening during the pandemic, it was a, it was an integration of two companies and um, the problem they, or the decision they made at the beginning of the um, integration was that they were going to make all of these changes at one time. I'm talking major changes. So they were going to make changes to the sales organization. And I'm talking really questionable changes. Okay. When you say, when you say at one time, do you mean like all within the same week or something like that? Or all with, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so if project management said this is going to be eight, an 18 month initiative, they decided that they were going to do everything at the very beginning. Wow. wow. Okay. So that was the first challenging decision they made. 
as a result of that, they got to maybe month nine and they realized, oh my God, why did we do this? Because this is creating more issues for us than we ever imagined. And I was thinking, and had you asked me first, <laughs> you would never be in this position. One of the problems though, and it, just as a side note, is that I'm often brought in a little too late. So they've already they've already made their, um, they've already set their plan in place. And then they realize, oh my gosh, this thing isn't going the way that we want it to go. Let's bring in a change management firm. And then they're like, hey, Robin, can you help us fix all the problems that we've made in order to make this change? So anyway, they decided to make all these changes, these big bang changes. And I don't know, you've probably seen me even tweet about this or LinkedIn about this because I was just like, what are they doing? You can't make these big bang changes. You can't make all 10 of them at the same time. And so they got into month nine and they realized, oh crap, what did we do? And there's no way to undo it because you've already, you're already, you know, you've already let the horse out the gate, right? So, so you, there's you, no you're way committed to, already. You're, you are committed, committed. Right. And, and it just kind of, that issue just kind of snowballed. So now we get to the pandemic and bec and what happens is, is that when an, when an organization is going through an integration or any change, any large scale transformation happening in any organization, you can, you can guarantee that that first quarter after that change, there's going to be a productivity dip, which is going to lead to revenue dip. And the, the more you make these um, wrong decisions, the more that productivity dip is going to last or the longer it's going to last and the longer your, your revenue dip is going to last, okay? And so they got to month 12 and they realized that because of the changes they made that they had not come out of their productivity dip. So they were losing money instead of now being in a place where they should have been now making money. And then we got to month 18 and they were still not making money. And then the pandemic hit and then they had to furlough their salespeople. And then month like 24 hit and they were like trying, I mean, they were desperate at this point, right? So the CEO is like, do this, then do that. And then, and it was before we could, you know, implement this change that he was saying, try this. And I'm like, hey, can somebody invite me to the board meeting? <laughs> you know, to, <laughs> can somebody invite me to, the, to this leadership meeting? Because I need to say, stop this. Yeah, but you're but that is, gonna... but this is for you. Must feel like you're trying to plug the dam with bricks. Like it's just at this point, I felt like at this point I was overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah. And I literally would sit there with my head in my hands because I'm like, what is going on, and how many more changes are they going to initiate? trying to get back to a place of, you know, revenue, revenue generation. And nobody's asking me the right questions. Mm -hmm. So the people that I'm talking, that I'm dealing with every day directly, they're hearing what needs to happen or what doesn't need to happen. But the people who are making the decisions aren't hearing it. And I really, I was overwhelmed as the change expert. And so if I'm overwhelmed, I know the employees were overwhelmed right. and it was just, it was just horrible. And when I finally came off that project, it was almost a, yeah, yeah. Because that was stressful for me. Wow. So I know it was stressful for them. Uh, what about a win? You saw a change happening. You, you're going, this went great. Y'all asked the right questions. You made some great decisions. Not everybody's happy, but everybody feels like they know where they're going. So a win is a project uh, that probably happened two years prior to that, or maybe a year prior to that, um, where the leader was so on board with everything that I asked of him. And so sometimes 
many times in an engagement, I will do the ghost writing for a leader oh. if they're really, really busy. And, and then I will send that communication to that leader and say, hey, add your voice to this. So I've given them the body of the work. They just need to add it so it sounds like them. This leader, he was just so on top of it. I sent him something, bam, he responded, got it back to me. I mean, there were times when I said, okay, I'm going to need you to do a video because I want you to speak to the people, you know, face to face or whatever that case is. And he was like, sure, what do you need? And I mean, he just did it with, you know, no issues and no pushback. And he's like, you know, I'm busy, but I know that this is important and we need to make these changes. So let's go. And so everything I needed for him to do, he did it. And because of that, we were able to implement that change when we said we were going to implement that change. Mm -hmm. So it happened on time. There was no, okay, well, we're going to have to push back the implementation date. No, no, no. It's happening when it was supposed to happen because this leader did everything I asked them to do, Mm -hmm. which was quite unlike the project before it, same company, Uh different division, where the leader didn't do anything I wanted him to do. I and I, say, you you had you had two different attitudes. Like you had somebody who oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. what needed to be done, but you had somebody who seemed to probably think that they had it figured out. Yeah, the, the so the leader, same organization, different leader, different business unit. He thought he knew everything. So he he would not make available people that we needed to talk to. Recipe for the um, he actually said, he actually kind of threatens me and said, you know, we had a change person before and we got rid of her. I mean, you know, so it's like, whoa, is that a threat? I mean, <laughs> uh, he, his, his, his attitude was, I don't know why we're doing this anyway. The, the, the system we have in place is good enough. And so when you're dealing with somebody like that, that just makes it, I mean, they have no flexibility, right? So their emotional intelligence is not quite as mature. Yeah, we come right back to emotional intelligence. Uh mm -hmm. So their flexibility was very low, very low skill. And so because of that, we changed the implementation date three times. Well, what happens when you're changing the implementation date? That means that Whatever it cost us, whatever it cost the project has now tripled, if you will, because we've changed this date three times and we've changed this date because of you. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, so that very following engagement with that second leader, that was, that was sweet. <laughs> it was, it was beautiful. And so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Last question. Um, what is something that the everyday person, the everyday employee or the everyday community member in an organization, what do they need to know or what do they need to remember in order to help change management and go as smoothly as it can go? That they should ask questions. Mm. So remember I said emotions drive our behavior. Mm -hmm. And we go through four stages of emotion during a change initiative. Mm -hmm. So we acknowledge, we react, we investigate, and then we finally get to a place where we're ready to implement. Mm -hmm. It's in that reacting stage that people have a difficult time getting out of. So they're still angry. They're still frustrated. They're still questioning why. And they're still feeling a great deal of uncertainty to get yourself out of that stage and get yourself into a stage of investigating where you're now saying, okay, well, maybe maybe this isn't so bad. Maybe I can benefit from this change. Ooh, maybe I can look for a promotion. You know, Maybe I'll get a promotion. So in order to get to that spot, you've got to ask questions because the more questions you ask and get answered, the better you feel about what's going on. Even if you don't like the answer, you have an answer, right? Mm, mm, and so you mm. ask questions and you ask questions and you get on people's nerves and, <laughs> and you ask questions. And so the organization may or may not provide a, um, an avenue for employees or the community to ask those questions. If they know better, they will. But if they don't, you just ask anyway. You ask, you send emails, you do whatever you need to do until you get the answers you need 
in order to move forward. Very cool. So Dr. Robin Johnson, she is the founder and chief change leadership advisor for Design Org Solutions. Robin, thanks a lot for joining me on For Our You're Education. welcome. Glad to have been here. Change in any organization is a lot because there's so many moving parts, as you just heard Robin talk about. So what I really wanted folks to see is how those moving parts kind of work out. And now we are a bit more aware, right? And because we're more aware, we can react a bit better to any change happening in an organization, especially if it's a major change like a merger or an acquisition. And the more you know, the better you can plan. So for me, this is about stress management for the individual because our jobs are so important. We spend so much time at our jobs. And so knowing all of this stuff, we know that we can ask a lot of questions as Robin suggested. But in asking all of those questions, be ready for just about any answer, whether you like the answer or whether you don't like the answer. At least when you get the answer, you can make a decision how you're going to handle the change, whether that change means moving on in our organization or if that change means leaving the organization. At least you know what to do. Big thanks to my sis, Dr. Robin M.L. Johnson, for joining me on For Our Edification. Learn more about Robin and her organization, Design Org Solutions, by going to designorgsolns.com. That web address is in the show notes. So go check her out, please. And check out the For Our Edification page by going to eddiefrancis.com when you check it out. I want you to take a look at some episodes, listen to some episodes, take them on your drive to work, download the episodes, rate the episodes, give us some feedback, share with friends, all that good stuff. For Dr. Haleem Malik Francis, I'm Eddie Francis. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of For Our Edification.